Hey, Walter Sorrell's back with more tips for the knife maker. Today, we're talking grinds. There are a variety of different ways of grinding blades, hollow grinds, flat grinds, scandy grinds, all these different uh, grinding strategies that result in different kinds of knives. I had a viewer recently write to me and ask for kind of pluses and minuses evaluations of different kinds of grinds. Now, I did a video a while back where I showed some basics of grinding these different types of grinds. But what I'm going to try and do here is follow on to that video a little bit, but also talk about different kinds of grinds and the pluses and minuses of them more from a knife maker's standpoint than from a user's standpoint. So quickly, let me kind of run through what some of the basic grinds for knives are. It, you know, if you want to break them down into three general categories, you've got hollow grinds, you've got convex grinds, and then you've got a whole family of different kinds of flat grinds. There's a basic flat grind, which uh, typically runs from the cutting edge all the way up to the spine. It's ground flat on a flat platen on a belt grinder typically, but it also could be made with a file or a stone or something. Um, then there's a variant of that called the saber grind, which is ground not all the way up to the top of the spine so that you have a grind line that runs longitudinally down the blade. Uh, yet another variant is the scandy grind, which is uh, an even shallower uh, bevel similar to the saber grind, but the difference there is that with the saber grind um, and, a tip, and, and a standard flat grind, the blade comes all the way down and then at the very end there's a secondary bevel that forms the actual cutting edge of the knife. With a scandy grind, the knife actually goes or the bevel runs all the way down to the cutting edge. This makes for a very sharp knife. Finally, we have a chisel grind, which is just a bevel that is only cut onto one surface of the knife. Again, like the Scandi grind, typically it runs all the way down to the cutting edge of the blade. Now, uh, when it comes to hollow grinds, you know, basically there's just one standard hollow grind. The advantage of the hollow grind first is from a manufacturing standpoint, uh, you can do them on big wheels. Uh, in the early days of the cutlery industry, uh, great big rotary uh, wheels were used rather than belt grinders back in the 19th century. Of course, they didn't have belt grinders, and so rotary wheels uh, were a kind of natural way of manufacturing uh, knives using that hollow grind. And uh, it sort of speeded up the process over the, the methods that would have been used for flat grinding at the time. Now, beyond the manufacturing advantages of the hollow grind, uh, by bringing that blade edge in at this radius, you are able to make the final little edge of the blade very, very thin, which converts to sharpness and uh, superior cutting ability. The disadvantage of the a uh, hollow grind from that perspective is that that sharpness comes at a cost. The edge is not supported very well and so it's a, a more brittle, easy to chip kind of edge. So typically you're going to use that in, you know, things like pocket knives and um, other knives that maybe hunting knives, knives that are going to be used where sharpness is at a premium and you don't need a really um, robust cutting edge. So the convex grind obviously is the opposite of a hollow grind. It bows out somewhat as it runs down, as the bevels run down to the cutting edge. Of course, this means that the edge is very well supported. And so uh, convex grinds are used very commonly on blades that need to be extremely robust. Competition choppers, uh, the Japanese katana is another uh, example. So another uh, attribute of the convex grind is that typically they're ground all the way down to the cutting edge. There's no secondary uh, bevel there. And what that means is that they're also pretty sharp given that the geometry of the, of the convex grind starts out 
um, not naturally super sharp. Okay, so we've gotten a little recap of the various grinds out of the way. Let's turn to kind of their manufacturability, if you want to say it that way. What I'm going to do here is go into kind of how I grind these various types of grinds. So the intent here is not to show every single step in grinding all these different styles of grinds, but to kind of show some of the little nuances and differences between grinding different types of grinds. So let's talk grinding basics. First, have a clear idea of where you want to go. I always mark the center of my grind using a scribe. If I'm doing a saber type grind, I also typically mark the height of the bevel that I'm aiming for. This really helps you keep the grind lines even and parallel to the cutting edge. Once everything's marked, I head to the grinder. I'll begin by cutting in along the edge at a steeper angle than the angle I'll ultimately end up at. This will be the same for all the basic flat grind variations. If you go the other way, where you grind a really shallow grind, it's easy for the grind to get away from you and climb way too far up the edge. See, the one mistake you don't want to make on any flat grind is this right here. If the angle that you're holding the blade at exceeds the angle you're aiming for, you'll run the belt all the way up to the spine. This can either take a divot out of the spine or ruin any chance you had of creating a clean grind line, potentially scrapping the blade. So, whether it's classic flat that goes all the way up to the spine, scandy, chisel, saber, whatever, I want to start my bevel a hair steeper than where it will end up. From there, I'll keep finding that flat nice and gently, sensing where it is, then using pressure from my thumb or fingers to work that bevel back toward the spine. Now I like to start at the ricasso or plunge line, then work my way towards the tip of the knife. I pay close attention to that angle and maintain it, moving smoothly and cleanly out toward the tip. Let me jump in here to mention that today's video is sponsored by Combat Abrasives. They're a family-owned American manufacturer offering a wide selection of belts. Now I've used many of their belts including ceramic, aluminum oxide, and zirconium. The prices are good and their focus is specifically on the knife making community. Their basic aluminum oxide belts come in at a good price point and last a lot longer than some of the inexpensive belts that I've used in the past. Another thing that I've really been excited about is their ceramic belts for roughing in the 40, 60, and 120 grit range. Their performance is very competitive with the big manufacturers at about half the price. So check out their online shop by clicking the link in the description. Now here's a really important point that bears on grinding scandies and chisel grinds. When I'm contacting the blade to the platen, I never ever contact the spine side first. I just kiss the edge, holding the blade very gently, then feather it in until I'm sensing that the blade is flat to the platen. This takes some practice and sensitivity, but it's not like learning to throw a back foot slider or play the minute waltz. You can get it pretty quickly once you realize that you don't need to just slam the blade in there and hope that you get the right angle. Feel it. Now let's talk about the difference between grinding all the way to the spine versus a saber grind. Obviously, from a functional perspective, the saber grind will make for a stronger blade, but will cut less well, all things being equal. But how about the difference in grinding? It might seem like the flat grind is the easier of the two, because you don't have to maintain a nice, straight, pretty grind line. And that's true, but that doesn't mean there aren't pitfalls in grinding all the way to the spine, too. The key thing that I always do when I'm grinding flats is to prepare for subsequent grinding. What do I mean by that? Well, typically you rough out the flat with a very heavy grit belt, say a 40 or 60 grit. Now, I like ceramics at this stage because they're very aggressive and they last a long time. Then you'll move on to higher grit belts. If you go stampeding straight to your final grind line with your roughing belt, then you're not leaving yourself much room to maneuver. That's code for room to screw up with the higher grit belts. Let's say for the sake of argument that we're planning to go up to a 400 grit belt here. If we grind all the way to here with the 40, now I've got a 60, a 120, a 220, and a 400 to run through without moving this line at all. If you're good, you can maintain it pretty close to that line, but what if you mess up a little bit? So what's likely to happen if you're 
running a classic flat grind all the way up to the spine is that you'll take this little divot out where your blade meets the spine. That is no good. You want it to flow smoothly. So what I do on my roughing pass is to just leave the tiniest little grind line at the top. Maybe a sixteenth of an inch, a couple millimeters, that's all you need. Then, as I move up through higher grit belts, I can whittle that line down and end up with this. So what about saber grinds? Well, the same principle is at work here. If I know that I want to run my grind up an inch from the blade, then I need to quit roughing just a little shy of that. I don't try to get my roughing pass 100% perfect, but conversely, I don't want to be fussing with that line endlessly with 400 grit. It'll take forever. So, I figure on getting the line dead right by 120. Then, wherever I want to quit, I don't need to disturb that line at all. I'm just smoothing it out with the higher grit belts. All right, Scandies have gotten very popular, so let's talk about them briefly. First point is this. At the end of the day, a Scandies ground using exactly the same principles as the saber and flat grind. There's just one catch. If you get too greedy when you're sharpening the edge, this will happen. If it turns blue like that after you've already heat treated it, you're hosed. You've blown the temper, softened the edge, and it's back to the heat treat. By the way, everything I'm saying about Scandi grinds applies to chisel grinds too. The difficulty of removing that last little bit explains why most Japanese cutlers use big huge water-cooled rotary stones for grinding their blades. Almost no western knife makers own these, however. So, how do you get around this? I wish there was an easy answer, but there's not. First and foremost, you just have to be patient. You're going to have to thin that edge down the last little bit after heat treat. If you heat treat an edge that's been ground to zero, you'll almost certainly decarburize a tiny portion of the cutting edge, leaving it soft and weak. So what's that mean? You have to finish it on a hand stone? No, but you do have to be patient, go slow, and keep dunking that blade in your water bucket. Now I've got a cool mist system. I used it a lot when I first got it, but it's very messy, so I don't use it on every knife. But for thin blades like Scandies, it can be very helpful. If you make a lot of Scandies, this kind of system might be very useful to you. Another helpful point is that the finer the grit, the more the friction, and the more heat buildup you run into. So I don't recommend taking a Scandi or chisel grind up to 220 or 320 grit or whatever it might be before heat treating. After heat treating, thin the blade to zero on a relatively coarse grit, say 60, then turn to your higher grit belts. Here's another problem with these zero edges. Each time you feather the blade into the belt, you put a tiny little bevel or divot into the cutting edge. See how that looks? Now this really isn't an issue with normal flat grinds because you still have enough meat left at the end where you can fiddle with it without too much worry about burning your edge. But when your edge is going right down to zero, it's potentially a big problem. How do you avoid it? Again, I wish there was an easy answer, but the short answer is you don't. You just have to be very, very careful and recognize that the goal of your final pass will be to get that edge nice and clean. This means just take your time on that final pass. Finally, if you have a variable speed grinder, back that speed down a little once you turn to the higher grits. Alright, a couple of notes about chisel grinds. First point is, a chisel grind is either left-handed or right-handed. Make sure you know which one you're aiming for. If you're right-handed, you want the bevel on the right side of your knife as you're cutting with it, which means that it has to be ground from the left side of the platen. Okay, next we'll turn to hollow grinds. Hollow grinds have a lot to recommend them, but they have a lot of limitations too. As we said, they tend to be sharper but weaker than other grinds. But there are a number of limitations related to manufacture too, so let's go into those. Here's the first. When you hollow grind, whatever radius your contact wheel or grinding wheel is, that's the radius you're stuck with. Now why does this matter? Because that radius governs what size knife you can grind. A small radius wheel can't be used to grind a broad blade. If you try, this is what will happen. You'll eat right through the blade. Or, alternatively, you'll have to grind a very, very short bevel that makes the knife not very sharp. 
So first rule of hollow grinding is that you need wheels appropriate to whatever grind you intend to make. Now the fact that I'm using this little wheel tells you that I don't do much hollow grinding. If I did, I'd have a 12 or 14 inch for sure. So first point, if you're a hollow grind fanatic, think about your grinder up front. Two wheel grinders like the Burr King are intrinsically capable of taking bigger contact wheels than three wheel machines like the Bader and KMG. Now let's get into the nitty gritty. Like flat grinds, successfully freehand grinding a hollow grind takes feel. What you want to feel with a flat grind is the feeling of the blade bevel seating flat on that platen. Likewise, you want to feel even contact with the hollow on your blade seating firmly on the wheel. To that end, I try to grind a nice, aggressive, even hollow on my first pass. If you dink around, stab, and poke at it, you'll get this sort of thing happening. Then there's nothing to feel, it's just a big mess, and you'll find it nearly impossible to ever get to a good grind. Now in the flat grind section, I mentioned that you want to know where you're going on the blade. In other words, how wide your bevels are going to be. But that doesn't mean you can just arbitrarily define the width of a hollow grind. There's an optimal length to a hollow grind bevel which is dependent on both the radius of the wheel and the thickness of the steel. If you run a hollow grind up too high, the blade will be thicker on the edge, wasting the advantage you get by running a hollow grind in the first place. Last grind, convex. The advantage of the convex grind, as we said, is that it gives you a robust blade, but if you have no secondary bevel and run the grind all the way down to the edge, you still end up with something that cuts well. The disadvantage of convex grinds is similar for both the user and the maker. Specifically, it's kind of tricky to grind a consistent, clean convex edge, and that makes it harder to sharpen, too. So here are some tips. First. When you're first grinding a convex edge, don't worry about the convexity per se. Just treat it like a flat ground blade. It's not unusual for folks to overdo the convexity of a blade. You only need a little bit of that convexity. Some people run a consistent curve straight down to the edge, while others go more or less flat and then have a little convex section right before the edge. Personal preference. The challenge from a making perspective is the same either way, consistency. Now the typical notion is that convex blades are just made on a slack grinding setup, like this. The problem with slack grinding, if you've ever tried it, is that it actually doesn't grind consistently from the top to the bottom of the blade. It tends to grind really hard right at the cutting edge and somewhat less so toward the spine and to do almost no grinding at all in the middle of the blade. If you want a consistent cut, you have to back off on the pressure, and this slows the process. So, some hints. First, you don't have to do convex grinds on a slack belt setup at all. You can do them on a wheel. Some guys will use the top of the wheel. This is easiest, but I don't like it because of the possibility of throwing a knife into my chest. So you can also go onto the bottom of the wheel. Likewise, you can use a flat platen. Like I said earlier, just treat that convex ground blade like it's flat for the initial grinding, right up to the point where you want to smooth out that convexity. At that point, you have several choices. You can rock it back and forth on the flat platen. Good luck with that, unless you're doing a very short blade. It's very easy to dig little channels in the blade. Eventually, you'll reach a point where you need to smooth everything out. And this is where the slack belt setup is really nice. My Bader has a dedicated slack belt setup, but can you jury rig one? Sure, absolutely. Can you do it up here? Yep. I recommend standing to the side though, a knife in the throat might suck even worse than one in the chest. Can you do it here? Yep. Here? Yep. If you're careful not to bump the wheels. Now look, every grinder's different. You can get half flat, half slack setups, all kinds of things you can do. Another point is that belts are available in a variety of weights. So-called X and Y weights are harder, and so they tend to exert more even pressure. More flexible belts, like this J-Flex belt, are great for creating soft plunge lines, but they have a tendency to bite really hard into the edge and to cut almost not at all in the middle of the blade. 
This is why the more belts you have in your arsenal, the easier it is to solve specific grinding problems. One last point, if all else fails, you'd be surprised how a nice Japanese water stone can be used to finish up a lot of different things, from putting a final edge on a chisel ground blade or a scandy, to smoothing a convex ground blade. Okay, so, chisel grinds, scandies, saber grinds, they all have their place. Try them, use them, and see which ones work for you. Alright, that about wraps it up. Hope you got something out of this. You know, the main point here was not to give you every single nuance of all these different grinds. Of course, I don't use all of these grinds myself uh, in my day-to-day -day work. You know, the basic idea here is just to kind of give you an overview and a sense of some of the challenges that you might face when going from one grind to the next. Thanks for watching, guys. If you feel like you got something out of this video, don't forget to subscribe. Also, click on the link to Patreon for a great way to give back to the channel. Plus, check me out on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Links in the description. If you want something sharp and pointy, maybe a gift for yourself or one of the cooler people in your life, check out my Tactics Armory website and pick up one of our tactical or outdoor knives. And finally, if you want to learn to make hamons or Japanese swords, check out waltersorrelsblades.com where you can find videos about how I make hamons as well as forging, mounting, polishing, and fittings for Japanese swords. Thanks and see you soon!